If you were to ask a bunch of people on the streets the following question, what sort of stuff do clients talk to their psychologists about? You would probably get a list of things like feelings of depression, problems with their marriage, worries, anxieties, to name but a few. The common consensus would probably be that the only reason you go to a psychologist, a psychiatrist or any kind of therapist for that matter is to talk exclusively about negative stuff. In the 90s, a researcher and psychologist by the name of Martin Seligman believes that there was a problem with this. He believes there was a disproportionate focus on these perceived negative aspects of human thought and emotion. He believed that focusing solely on the mental disorders a client presented would, could only ever result in an incomplete understanding of how that person ticked, so to speak, and therefore could never fully show them how to live a full and meaningful life. The work of Seligman and his like-minded peers started to gain serious traction in the 90s and their writings, applied practices and research gave rise to a burgeoning field of psychology now known as positive psychology. Martin Seligman defines positive psychology as the scientific study of positive human functioning and flourishing on multiple levels that includes a biological, personal, relational, institutional, cultural and global dimensions of life. The exponents of positive psychology argued that after decades of the psychological focus being on mental illnesses and conditions like depression, anxiety and trauma, it was time to take the blinkers off and get people engaging with and more fully appreciating their strengths and not just highlighting their perceived mental weaknesses. This new way of thinking about well-being and mental health really caught on. Ivy League universities like Harvard started to offer happiness courses, which were quickly oversubscribed. More and more psychologists started to recalibrate their therapeutic focus to include more emphasis on personal growth as opposed to exclusively talking with their clients about psychopathology and mental illness. There was also a rise in the cultural appetite for all things happy. Movies like Eat, Pray, Love and The Pursuit of Happiness did well at the box office. Books like The Art of Happiness were cult hits. And retreat centers with mission statements oriented around happiness started popping everywhere in the smallest one-horse towns. Nowadays, if someone mentions that they care more about their level of happiness than the amount of money in their bank account, there is a decent chance people will not approvingly, as opposed to being shocked or maybe even appalled. This trends towards quantifying and validating happiness as an almost tangible thing, a commodity, word measuring, has been picked up at a national scale too. In 1972, Bhutan started to measure on a yearly basis the gross national happiness of their population instead of focusing solely on their gross domestic products, which of course is a completely financial measurement of how well a country is doing. In the wake of Bhutan's example, many countries and cities have now created and instigated their own happiness measurements. In 2007, Thailand launched the Green and Happiness Index. In 2012, the city of Seattle in Washington lost its own happiness index initiative, emphasizing measurements similar to the GNH. And in 2014, the UK launched its initiative to assess the well-being and happiness of its own citizens. Like a lot of ways of thinking in psychology, this current focus on happiness is not exactly new. A lot of ancient cultures and religions gave lofty credence to the concept of happiness. 
the early Hebrews believed that you could achieve earthly and heavenly happiness by living in accordance with strict rules laid down by a divine being. The ancient Greeks developed schools of thought based around the concepts of attainable happiness, whilst other philosophers were of the opinion that you could reach happiness through logic and rational analysis. Christianity teaches the only path to true happiness in this life or the next is if you let Jesus into your heart, whilst Buddhism expounds mindfulness, meditation and freedom from unhealthy attachments as a method of achieving happier and more balanced life. But what exactly is happiness and how should we define this ethereal thing that we all seem to want more of? Is partying all night long in the throes of an ecstasy high or alcohol bus happiness? Does the surge of adrenaline resulting from stealing something and getting away with it constitute being happy? Is happiness to be found between the sheets of multiple sexual partners? There are of course countless and often conflicting views on what happiness is and is often thought to be defined by the individual. But Sonja Libomirski, professor of psychology at the University of California and longtime advocate of positive psychology, offers a definition which is fairly comprehensive and accessible to a broad range of people, regardless how they individually get their kicks. She defines happiness as the experience of joy, contentment or positive well-being combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful and worthwhile. According to this definition, true happiness can only really be said to be created through a synergy of the two components of superficial pleasure and deeper meaning. So whilst someone doing drugs is very likely experiencing superficial emotions of joy, contentment or positive well-being, whilst they are drunk or high, there is no guarantee that such feelings are associated with deeper thoughts or one's life being good, meaningful and worthwhile. This is especially true during the come down or hangover. These short-lived pleasure highs afforded by substance or behavioral addictions often have an ambivalent or negative effect in the long run, as a lot of our valued clients at Dara can attest to. Both pleasure and meaning need to be in a mix to make the secret sauce of happiness. True happiness, therefore, as expounded by advocates of positive psychology, is all about experiencing the pleasure in the context of the things that connect deeply with your core values. So now we have a definition to work with and we have some concepts of the difference between pleasure and happiness. But we still don't know what can contribute to our level of happiness. So how can we better cultivate it? According to Hubert Mininsky, 50% of our experience of true happiness is the result of our genetic makeup, 10% is due to our life circumstances and 40% depends on our daily activities. So that means that we can influence a huge chunk of our happiness almost just by behaving in a positive way. But what should you do to move the needle on this 40%? According to the Greater Good Science Center Research Institute at the Berkeley University of California, there are seven key steps you can use right now to kickstart your happiness. Pay attention. Studies show that mindful people have stronger immune systems and are less likely to be hostile or anxious. Keep friends close. Social connections are key to happiness. Research indicates it's quality more than quantity. Make time for the closest to you. Give thanks. Research reveals 
the enormous power of simply counting our blessings. Regular expressions of gratitude promote optimism, better health and greater satisfaction with life. Drop grudges. When we forgive those who have wronged us, we feel better about ourselves, experience more positive emotions and feel closer to others. Get moving! Regular exercise increases self-esteem, reduces anxiety and stress and may well be the most effective instant happiness booster of all. Practice kindness. Being kind to others makes us feel good. Altruistic acts light up the same pleasure centers in the brain as food and sex. Get rest. Research has linked lower sleep to lower happiness. An interesting study by Nobel Prize winner psychologist Daniel Kahneman found that getting just one more hour of sleep might have a greater effect on happiness than 60,000 US dollar pay rise. But like everything we tell our clients, don't take a word for it, or even the words of researchers and scientific experts. We are all individuals, so try it out for yourself and see if positive psychology and the practices I mentioned earlier will work for you. We can't guarantee that it will definitely bring you happiness. But the pursuit of happiness, well, that's an unalienable right.